Welcome back. Uh, this is the second day of the Forum for the Future of Culture. Uh, this meeting is uh, titled Where There Is No Law, There Is No Crime, From Sexual Autonomy to a World Without Repression, and it'll be moderated by Amel Manna and Yulia Strzeminska. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say when the idea for the, how uh, we came up with uh, this uh, debate, we wanted a discussion around ways of uh, conceiving of uh, alternatives uh, to the social reality we have, uh, conceiving of an alternative state, an alternative social reality without a state. It was a fairly broad topic, so we wanted to anchor it in something more tangible, more specific. Uh, we believe that thinking about alternatives begins with ideas as a uh, question of uh, ideology, and that's uh, the way we wanted it to go. So decriminalization and uh, legalization our starting point for that was what happened around abortion. For many years before, we uh, were uh, talking about what type of abortion law we need, but then a uh, movement um, stepped forward and said, uh, what do we need an abortion law for? And uh, we uh, thought that perhaps uh, we weren't asking the question properly, uh, since uh, perhaps the best law is no law at all. So we wanted to look at it more broadly, look at criminalization, decriminalization, legality from uh, different uh, perspectives. We have activists uh, working in various uh, fields where this discussion is taking place, and it doesn't look uh, the same. Of course, we want to create a space for a reflection, because when organizing this uh, debate, we, I realized uh, how little we know, how little we still, how, how much we still need to um, think about, but since this is a forum for the future of culture and not the past, I suppose we can allow for a degree of uncertainty. We don't have to uh, put forward um, suggestions or solutions, but uh, discussion, talking is a value unto itself. It can lead to, to new directions, uh, to uh, proposing new paradigms, which is why I'm uh, looking forward to this discussion to hear what our uh, guests will have to say and Yulia will introduce our guests. Uh, good afternoon. Um, our guests today are Karolina Vienskiewicz, who's an activist with the Abortion Dream Team. The Abortion Dream Team is part of the Abortion Without uh, Borders Coalition, the phone number of which is uh, 229 Agata Juban who is a sociologist at uh, Yagalonian University uh, Institute of Sociology. She's an outreach worker and a translator, uh, researches the situation of uh, sex workers in Poland and Europe. Magdalena Bartnik is an addiction therapist in the uh, Precursor um, Social Policy Foundation. She specializes in harm reduction, a uh, researcher and uh, practitioner, Ola Ziemiańska, is an activist who So Yulia's screen has uh, frozen, so uh, let me just uh, say that Ola uh, is involved in the Spila Collective and the anarchist uh, Black Cross. Uh, she is involved in various areas of um, anti-repressive initiatives. And uh, we wanted to begin with a question that might uh, open up the discussion. 
and ask uh, and begin by asking uh, Carolina what uh, decriminalization of abortion means practically. So what's the difference between that and uh, legalization? Why are you calling for uh, decriminalization? So what does that involve? I'll try to be brief and um, talk about the practical dimension. Um, when talking about uh, decriminalization, I'm in favor of deregulating abortion. I think that uh, legalization as a process is uh, generally harmful, but um, uh, I think decriminalization will be sufficient, although um, not in all aspects, but I'll get back to that. I think that uh, criminalization is the product of the abortion law, namely the outcome of legalization of abortion, making abortion um, legalized, uh, regulated, by which I mean regulated and uh, governed by certain principles that say when you can and when you can't, that define, that limit access to abortion, that uh, define who is entitled to abortion and in what... Uh, so I'm saying that all abortion law is anti-abortion, as it stems from the belief that abortion is bad and should be restricted, abortion stigma, which is uh, perpetuated because it involves the criminal code, the penal code, uh, a code which is uh, very fetishized, I would say, and which is uh, believed seen as a reflection of uh, moral standards, but it also uh, imposes moral standards by saying what's right and what's wrong. And uh, abortion, as defined in the criminal code, actually is uh, seen as something wrong. Uh, decriminalization, practically, in a Polish context, would mean being more, uh, would be the state, uh, being more okay. So, I mean, today we can have abortions, but the doctor who performs the procedure in Poland or the person who helps us buy uh, pills or who pays for the pills or who drives us to the doctor, that person risks a criminal liability. So, 98% of the people who need to have an abortion uh, in Poland are not, I mean, the state's not interested. The state says, do what you want, I won't put you in prison, your abortion doesn't concern me, you can go abroad, you can buy pills, I don't care. That's what the state says. Uh, the state only performs uh, abortion uh, in a limited extent uh, and only as, as long as you find a doctor willing to do so. Um, but for me, decriminalization would be um, consistent with the state uh, not being concerned with us. And I'm not talking about the Law and Justice Party, I'm talking about the Polish state over the last 30 years. So decriminalization for me would be uh, consistent, would be coherent. I mean, uh, the state says, I don't care about your abortion. I don't care who performs the abortion, who helps you do what you want. As the state, I cannot, I will not uh, provide an abortion at a hospital, I will not provide pills, I will not write out the prescription, but if you want to do it on your own, then uh, do it, I will not uh, criminalize people in your surroundings, in your environment. I mean, people say, so what's the point? I mean, you can have abortions. We have a freedom to perform abortions to some extent, but they are criminalized, and the people around us, the people supporting us, are at risk, but it also perpetuates uh, this uh, stigma. So uh, the state is saying, uh, we don't care about you, uh, we don't care uh, how you'll perform the abortion, whether you can afford it, whether you um, have to uh, take out a loan or uh, get in debt, or whether abortion without uh, borders will uh, pay for it. It spent uh, 300,000 uh, lotties financing uh, uh, abortions for people in Poland uh, who didn't have the money. Of course, uh, a lot more uh, people in Poland uh, paid for the abortion themselves. 
but uh, abortion without uh, borders uh, provided supplied 300,000 uh, zloty worth of help. So uh, prosecuting abortion is not the first, is not the priority, nor was it a priority for any government. But we need to be aware that criminalizing abortion sends a message. You're saying, uh, we don't care about you, but you're supposed to be afraid of uh, liability. If somebody supports you, they risk uh, uh, prosecution. It's uh, bad, and uh, generally, uh, so, uh, and not everybody in Poland knows that uh, having an abortion is uh, is not a criminal act. Uh, so, uh, somebody will denounce you. There's this fear that they'll take your children away. They'll fire you. They'll strip you of your rights. And there's this atmosphere that's uh, created. So. Uh, we don't really care about you. Okay, I won't put you in jail, but the people around you, I'll, the state will prosecute them just uh, randomly. But uh, the message is that abortion is bad. It's in the criminal code, and you're supposed to think about abortion as if it were a crime. I mean, abortion itself is not a crime, but... At a symbolic level, abortion is associated with criminality, even if uh, having an abortion yourself is not a crime, and that's uh, um, a basic, right? But um, so that's what it, that's the message. I believe that decriminalizing abortion would uh, reduce uh, the stigma, would... Uh, and would be a great step towards normalizing abortion, towards, and so we shouldn't see it uh, in terms of a crime, because of course you can have crimes associated with abortion, with uh, people forcing uh, someone to have an abortion, but we don't need a separate legislation, we don't need Article 152 or 153, because if somebody's uh, health suffers or if somebody dies, during a uh, backstreet abortion, then we have the criminal code. Uh, so it's not a lethal abortion. We can have manslaughter or homicide, and that could be the charge of failure to provide uh, help. Uh, so for me, decriminalizing abortion in practice would be a step towards uh, destigmatizing it. And it's not that we can expect uh, something in a hospital. Abortion wouldn't be legal, but it would be free from this uh, stigma, this dimension of criminality, it would be, uh, so it would be more consistent, uh, because now it doesn't really make sense, it's not coherent. It, and in practice, uh, this would mean that we can do what we want with our pregnancies and not uh, put people helping us at risk. Because what's so bad about a doctor taking 3,000 zlotys and say, okay, I'll perform the procedure? Uh, they, you can't get it in a hospital, you can afford it, you can... I mean, I, you, I have the skills necessary and you have to pay me for my service. But now you have to pay me 6,000 because I can go to jail, that's what the doctor would say. And who could afford that? Um, but, yeah, so we still... So, I mean, we can't uh, go to a hospital. Uh, the National Health Fund uh, wouldn't compensate hospitals. Abortion would uh, still be available for like 2% of the population, but it, it would be free of the risk. It wouldn't be... Um, there wouldn't be the uh, dimension of criminality, and you don't should you wouldn't be afraid that if you tell someone about it, uh, bad things might happen. So that's a serious uh, problem. It has to do with destigmatizing, normalizing abortion, and, and abortion is a service. It's a good. It's a commodity, and uh, it would um, arrange, organize this market uh, without the uh, burden, the stigma that somebody's uh, committing a crime and putting other people at risk of prosecution. And I think that, that would be a first and very uh, tangible outcome. Uh, consequently, this might lead 
to a serious um, uh, social change where we wouldn't uh, we would stop thinking that abortion should be regulated by separate uh, regulations okay thank you and in the wake of that i want to ask Ragato about uh, sex work and the need to have um, a law regulating that because uh, for you as far as i know the uh, demand to decriminalize uh, sex work uh, has to do with uh, recognizing sex work as work so what is the connection between these two demands and these two uh, fronts, if you will. Right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, uh, inviting me to this uh, debate, which I think is very important. I think that a lot of issues in sex work uh, have a lot in common with abortion when it comes to the way we uh, see the law. It uh, comes, it stems from a similar approach, uh, the rebellion uh, protests uh, by vulnerable people, disadvantaged people who were at risk of incrimination, of uh, prosecution in the states, um, and uh, protested against uh, legislation that uh, targeted the vulnerable, uh, people who couldn't afford to pay thousands of dollars for an abortion, or who couldn't afford to pay a fine for sex work, because in the States, uh, sex work is uh, subject to a fine. I'll begin by mapping out the situation in Poland. In Poland, sex work is uh, criminalized, uh, which, is, uh, which also uh, criminalizes uh, third parties, uh, people who organize and facilitate sex work. So it's uh, l exactly like it is in with abortion. Uh, sex work as such is not criminalized or penalized, although it is by the misdemeanor, uh, code of misdemeanors, which uh, prosecutes uh, soliciting. And the police uh, understand this, interpret this uh, arbitrarily. So we have indirect uh, penalization, but we don't have criminalization. This mainly affects uh, people working outside in the street or along the um, highways, immigrants, uh, people who are most uh, vulnerable. Uh, sex workers are not uh, criminalized, but all uh, employment relations and workplaces are criminalized uh, because of third-party criminalization. Uh, what are third parties? In uh, public uh, discourse, uh, we have the figure of uh, procurers or pimps uh, who are in our culture also stigmatized and i don't want to get into that but so this is a very broad a very uh, vast uh, category that's associated with uh, violent men who um force uh, sex workers to give them money i'm not saying that uh, such men don't exist and uh, violent individuals ought to be uh, criminalized uh, because, I mean, but we have separate uh, regulations which uh, prosecute um, forcing people into sex work or who which uh, prosecute uh, rape or violence. But so we have adequate regulations, but we have a situation where there's a mechanism that uh, criminalizes a whole group of people who uh, perform uh, different functions. Uh, this can be a receptionist, a telephone operator, uh, this who takes um, appointments. This can be a driver who uh, drives a sex worker to their workplace and uh, looks after their security. Uh, this can be somebody who knows where a sex worker is, who have their phone number. Uh, so all, all different uh, positions, uh, different functions, which uh, aren't uh, related directly uh, to this image of a violent and it's also a racist uh, stereotype of a violent uh, procurer but uh, these are people um, supporting or helping uh, sex workers and apologies just uh, don't um, send chat messages but you send uh, your chat messages directly to yourselves because it distracts me i we have situations where uh, people decide to uh, work in a managed environment, to work with uh, people, other people, for their own safety. 
and the law uh, criminalizing the third parties uh, criminalizes uh, attempts uh, by sex workers to be safe. Uh, and, uh, so, yes, definitely uh, criminalize uh, trafficking, human trafficking, which is a crime, and it's in the uh, code. Uh, criminalize uh, fo forcing someone into sex work, definitely. But criminalizing uh, third parties in Poland means that all uh, worker relations are criminalized. And this uh, generates uh, organized uh, gangs, uh, which are uh, prosecuted by the police. Uh, the police uh, shuts down uh, workplaces, uh, sex workers lose their jobs, and we have a situation where this uh, um, law is uh, self-validating. Uh, so if we assume that you have an organized uh, crime operation, which includes uh, drivers and uh, telephone operators, or um, people who are in charge of appointments and uh, sex workers, then we have a whole um, system. And uh, sex work is additionally not seen as work. Uh, sex workers with uh, no security have no security. Um, and uh, so sex work is defined in terms of uh, criminal law, but not in terms of uh, labor law which would be a mechanism that would give sex workers some sort of uh, protection. And uh, this is where we have the I don't care about you, but we want you to be afraid. And it's the same uh, mechanism that uh, Karolina described, where a law which uh, criminalizes prostitutes uh, third parties is in theory intended to protect sex workers against the violence by organized crime, but it doesn't give sex workers any protection against exploitation in everyday work and any protection against the violence at work, nor does it give sex workers any uh, tools uh, to protect any way of protecting themselves from uh, exploitation. I call it institutionalized abandonment where uh, sex workers are left to themselves, left to cope uh, for themselves in when dealing with uh, exploitation. Only sometimes there will be police raids on the workplace, in the workplace, and they'll be left without a job. Even if it's a good, uh, if they have a good employer, they have a good organization, they feel safe, uh, they have... Uh, um, security, but uh, the police uh, treats uh, such workplaces like any exploitative environment. And the response here is fear, as Karolina mentioned, by criminalizing the workplace, by criminalizing your uh, work relations, you have a situation where uh, you're afraid that the police will come and uh, shut down your uh, workplace and you'll be left in the lurch. Uh, recently, uh, we wrote uh, that about uh, raids, uh, in uh, police raids on workplaces which employ uh, migrants. Migrants, uh, migrant sex workers uh, lost uh, their job, they were left without any income. So the uh, police comes crashing in in shining armor, saying that they clamped down and broke up a gang while uh, doing nothing about the security or the precarious uh, position of uh, the sex workers. Uh, instead, uh, normally uh, they, there will be articles where the police uh, boast of what a good job they did, although uh, they did leave uh, sex workers without any uh, resources. And uh, our response by uh, us, I mean uh, the search worker community, international networks uh, supporting search workers, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and other organizations are calling for decriminalization. We want to abolish all uh, criminality of uh, sex work. Uh, this can be, uh, for instance, so we would abolish the uh, provision or the law against uh, soliciting, which is a sexist, where and it allows uh, it gives police uh, discretion to arrest uh, women who are dressed uh, provocatively 
and accused of uh, soliciting, and also we would abolish uh, criminalization of third parties uh, because, again, it still uh, criminalizes the workplace of such workers. And uh, so, again, we have the issue of legalization versus uh, criminalization. Uh, Car Carolina said that legalization is a tool for exclusion and uh, making abortion and introducing a hierarchy. So abortion up until week something is okay and after week something is not. And in Poland we have this fetish of uh, week 12 for some reason and all left-wing parties are uh, saying that abortion up until week 12 is okay. But if you find out you're pregnant in week 14, then sorry, you're not respectable enough, so you have to go abroad. And, uh, and this mechanism uh, excludes everybody who uh, doesn't meet the 12-week uh, criterion. That's arbitrary. There are no medical reasons. It's uh, purely uh, arbitrary. And the same goes for legalizing uh, sex work. If we look at countries that legalized uh, sex work, a registration in uh, at the police station. So it's not criminal, but it's a threshold. It uh, puts us uh, in the. So it's 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 related to uh, police and uh, crim criminal. So uh, uh, mandatory uh, medical testing, which means that the people don't have to look after their uh, medical their health because the sex worker is has been tested, although this involves. Um, uh, for instance, uh, clients demanding um, sex without condoms. So uh, only uh, women who are single can work, or they can only work in uh, uh, in the street or in specified uh, places. They can't decide where they work. And uh, migrants are also uh, not able. Uh, uh, so, so legalizing sex work only for uh, individuals uh, from the European Union and not outside. So a Polish uh, woman can work legally in Germany if she has a residence permit, but someone from Ukraine uh, cannot. So uh, it uh, excludes a whole uh, lot of people from uh, working uh, lawfully and forces them to work uh, unlawfully or uh, illicitly. So legalizing sex work where uh, the law enforcement uh, agencies uh, say who can work where, how, with whom and in what uh, employee relations or uh, so how sex work can be uh, carried out. So, And the majority of uh, sex workers don't uh, fit the uh, criteria. They don't uh, and they're left outside the, um, they have to operate outside of the legal context and uh, so they're left um, in the same situation as it is in uh, countries which uh, criminalize. Uh, decriminalization does not involve uh, deregulation unlike abortion. So decriminalization means that uh, uh, decriminalization doesn't make sex work uh, um, special. It doesn't introduce uh, special regulations but the uh, services, because sex work is a service, just like uh, performing an abortion, a medical procedure. So the whole sector of sex work uh, services is covered by uh, employment law, by uh, regulations. So if uh, a country regulates, uh, for instance, any employee relations, if it has a labor code that says uh, how people can engage uh, occupational health, health and safety for various uh, sectors, these uh, will apply to sex work, and sex work will be part, will be covered by existing regulation, and this is the case in which in countries where sex work was decriminalized. So it's covered by existing regulations, but there won't be special, restrictive, exclusive uh, um, exclu and uh, regulatory um, regulations that are designed to punish sex workers. Thank you. Thanks, and I was wondering, you've uh, raised a lot of issues that I'd like to explore further, but maybe we can get back to that in the next part of our discussion. I wanted to ask Magdalena Bartnik whether it's uh, similar, because I believe it's not exactly the same, in drug policy. So for you, you're looking at legalizing drugs 
while decriminalization is a minimum goal. So uh, could you tell us why that is? That's right. In this field, the goals and the change we want to achieve are different than in the areas the previous speakers have uh, described. Criminalization has to do with demand, that is, the users of psychoactive substances. We want to abolish uh, fines, uh, punishment for possession. Drug policy is an interface of health and criminal policy, and uh, it's at the intersection of uh, prevention therapy and repression, and what's being done in terms of repression is in conflict, or it actually prevents uh, prevention and the therapy. So decriminalization would be the first step for users, uh, people who not the people who sell or deal drugs, but people who use drugs. So the point is to treat using as a public health issue. And this is this decriminalization of all psychoactive substances in 2001 was done in Portugal. And they see it as a success because the goal was achieved. Uh, drug use has not gone up. In fact, uh, the number, the numbers of uh, young users have actually gone down and uh, HIV infection rates are lower as our uh, as is mortality as our deaths are caused by using psychoactive substances so decriminalization is a priority and it's something that people are calling for to stop criminalizing users because that's a vicious circle and if uh, users are criminalized, they are treated as uh, criminals and not as uh, people who are sick. There's also the question whether users of psychoactive substances have to be defined one way or another. Uh, maybe we should see it in terms of freedom, don't see them as criminals. So, it's not a law enforcement issue, nor see them see it as a health policy issue. And this uh, perspective is becoming uh, viable when we see it in terms of legalization, because the long-term objective, when we're looking at drugs, in the long-term drugs rather than drug addiction, so the goal, the objective would be to end the war on drugs, to move away from the prohibitive regime, because uh, decriminalization simply lifts uh, penalties uh, for possession, but the distribution and the production is uh, still done by criminal organizations. So what changes is the situation of users, because they're not criminalized, and this uh, destigmatizes them. It's easier for them to ask for help uh, to go into therapy. They feel safer, but the market remains the same, basically, and it's uh, governed by the rules. And the same rules. So, in terms of uh, long-term goals, a goal that would be very far off, I mean, today we can call for decriminalization, and it's uh, the subject of discussion, but there are very many circles and uh, communities for whom it's uh, difficult to even to say the word legalization, and that's very difficult. Uh, you can't uh, work out a compromise or a consensus. But if anything is to change, I mean, if we want change the situation in any way, 
then we can't stop at decriminalization. That's not enough. I mean, it's... Um, it does help users get help and support because uh, criminalization affects uh, the disadvantaged and the marginalized, most non-problem users, and most uh, people who use the psychoactive substances are non-problem users, so they wouldn't be affected by uh, decriminalization because they enjoy privilege, and the people who are most affected, the people who are most harmed, are people from communities that are disadvantaged, that are in a difficult uh, situation, and there's a lot of examples you can do. I don't know whether we'll have time to talk about the world of the future, the way we see. Uh, legalization and where it would lead, so there will be time maybe to expand on that, but decriminalization is just uh, something that needs to happen, but it's not the objective, it's just a step in the right direction. Thanks, and of course we will have time for that shortly, in fact, because the way we designed this discussion is that we wanted to look at a concept and apply it as considered in terms of various uh, realities, uh, various situations, and look at the demands that um, these groups are making, how it looks different in different circumstances, and use this as a starting point to imagine a new reality. My next uh, question goes out to uh, Helena, because for technical reasons, I wasn't able to do that at the beginning. Helena de Clare is an activist uh, who works with the Warsaw Anarchist uh, Federation and the Milo Mazurkiewicz Solidarity Fund. I wanted to ask you, because when we talk about criminalization, decriminalization, legalization, but also medicalization, which can often be a problem in many of these areas, the voice of non-cisgender persons is heard, uh, showing that uh, legalization, legalism, criminalization, it defines the boundaries of uh, crime and the law, but they create uh, binary gender categories, or they perpetuate that, and that can lead to exclusion, so I wanted to ask what is the about the repressive nature of criminalization and the legalism or a more legalist approach from the standpoint of non cisgender individuals and uh, how do you see that see that perspective which I think is very important well first of all thanks for having me I think this is an important subject, and I hope we'll be able, thanks to discussion, to come to some interesting uh, conclusions. As regards the perspective of non cis gender uh, individuals, I think I can start by describing what it's like in our country to talk about the process, because in a way, it is legalized in the sense that there's a path, a legal path that's been defined that people who want to reassign their gender legally. And this path, this uh, procedure has changed as far as I know in the 1990s. Uh, you had to sue the hospital that wrongfully uh, assigned your gender at birth. Then it changed and now you have to sue your parents, which shows that I mean, you have to sue somebody, you have to sue your parents, and that in itself is not okay. And it creates the impression that these things uh, have to be settled in court, 
więc, więc to jest taka, taki jakby, no, to jest na pewno mi się nie podoba w tym wszystkim. Nobody's happy with that, nobody likes that. And the whole idea that uh, doctors get involved, that you need expert opinions, that you have uh, people interfering or um, looking closely, because if you want legal reassignment of your gender, then you have to uh, submit uh, uh, expert opinions by sexologists, uh, psychiatrists and um, psychologists, and you also have to pay to launch the proceedings, to file the lawsuit, you have to pay for the expert opinion, you have to pay to have an appointment with the specialists, and these are thousands of zlotys we're talking about, which in itself means that not everybody can afford that, and even you uh, have uh, your legal fees waived, which is difficult, uh, you need to get the medical uh, documentation, and if you want to do that through the National Health Fund, it's uh, definitely not easy to get that done. I mean, it's possible, but uh, it does require waiting a long time. And it also means that uh, people who need help to change their personal data uh, to be able to find work uh, to get hormone therapy. They are subject to so-called real-life tests uh, to verify if they won't uh, change their mind. If, uh, I mean, it's, uh, so there are a number of similarities that I see here where the state imposes um, obligations. We have to prove, demonstrate that our mind is made up, that we want to do this, that we won't bail at some point, that uh, if before transition uh, there's a lot of demeaning uh, requirements, uh, for instance, uh, the courts uh, uh, or court-appointed experts um, concluded that if somebody's not straight, if they're not heterosexual, then something's wrong with that person. And that person's not really transgender, but it's a different uh, situation. So there's often the need to pass uh, tests uh, where they ask you about uh, details, uh, totally ridiculous uh, details, like how many times a day do you think about having sex with someone? or they asked you about uh, your personal life, or they asked you about your dysphoria, and all these things, well, if you're uh, grilled about that for an hour, it can trigger you, and the whole uh, process can re-traumatize people who have it hard anyway, <coughs> because, I mean, being a transgender person in Poland, the trauma begins at an early age, usually, especially if you don't have a supportive family. So legalization requires that we demonstrate uh, things. You also need to be economically privileged, while in exchange we don't get a lot. We won't get reimbursement of uh, basic, the cost of basic medical procedure. Uh, normally, people have to pay for the procedures themselves, and uh, transgender transgender um, individuals. An operation surgery can cost uh, dozens, if not uh, hundreds of thousands of zlotys, and uh, not a lot of people can afford that. So the only thing to do is emigrate and uh, try your luck um, in another country, in a country that uh, reimburses the cost of uh, procedures. Yeah. Uh, so there's not a lot of uh, carrot, mainly, mainly stick and no carrot. Uh, whereas uh, there is a legal procedure, but the medical procedure that uh, of like home hormone therapy, uh, there are no standards, and every doctor 
as their own standards. Some doctors require uh, EEGs, others uh, want you to do your karyotype um, test, uh, others need um, CTs, um, weird uh, procedures, weird uh, examinations that you have to pay for. It's just a piece of paper presented in court to prove that some diagnostics uh, have been done, uh, even though it's really not um, justified. Other, most doctors have their own standards. Uh, some of them, uh, their knowledge is uh, from the 1980s and 1990s. They prescribe medication that's outdated, that can even uh, harm or um, people because they use uh, outdated methods of hormone therapy. I know that. I run a website called uh, Trans Research where I describe uh, safe uh, hormone therapy. So to get hormones, you need to have a lot of appointments, uh, real life uh, tests uh, where the doctor expects that someone who's a trans woman who never had hormones and who doesn't well, who won't pass as a woman. So the doctor expects uh, that the person comes to them wearing a dress, because otherwise the doctor will conclude that the person is not a true trans um, gender person. And so it's a question of gatekeeping. While, uh, you know, um, obviously, if somebody who doesn't pass as a woman, if they uh, walk across town or travel from town, from city to city, if they uh, travel wearing a dress, it's practically sure that they'll be a victim of violence, but not a lot of people realize that. And besides, uh, the binary mechanisms are very strong. I personally had to explain why it was that as a child I played with cars and not dolls, even though I had no choice, because uh, those were the toys my parents uh, gave me. So. I remember speaking to a psychiatrist who uh, uh, challenged, who said I couldn't be transgender because the toys uh, didn't fit or because I uh, came to the doctor's office wearing pants and she said that I needed to wear something more feminine for the next appointment, say. And there's a, there was there were a lot of um, situations like that. It's it is humiliating because you have to tell strangers about all the trauma you experienced, and it uh, re-traumatizes you, like I said before. And what else? As I said, it's a very binary process. Non-binary individuals who don't fit, uh, who don't comply with model of um, who want to, they're expected to be a hundred percent male or a hundred percent female. All these uh, people uh, are outside the system. They have pretend to be binary. For instance, uh, some trans gender I mean, individuals, like trans men, for instance, who only want uh, pop surgery. They just want their breasts removed. They don't want other operations. And to do that, they have to pretend to be binary individuals. So I was, uh, because only binary trans men are afforded the possibility of having uh, top surgery. And what else can I say? I can. Uh, there's a model that, but maybe I'll talk about that later, uh, how things could look, a model of decriminalization that would empower non, uh, that would empower transgender individuals instead of forcing them 
to comply with a model that uh, forces them to be binary and so you have to often have to pretend things you have to pretend you're straight you have to pretend you're and uh, things are like dredged out from your past uh, even though um, transgender uh, individuals have experience that they don't want to share with other people so there's a lot of things that i mean i was going to mention something else i forgot and my computer keeps uh, freezing i can't uh, take a look at my notes so i'll just uh, maybe end there and uh, i'll get back to these things later on thanks sure i think we'll have time for that and um, we have some time left so now i wanted to ask to look at the bigger picture and ask uh, Ola uh, deals with repression once it uh, takes part takes place uh, regardless of the area and as a spila you have experience of supporting uh, people who are the victim of homophobic uh, violence or people who resist in um, climate rebellion, anarchists, uh, people protesting against the ruling of the Constitutional Court, so very different areas. And what you do um, stems from the values of uh, solidarity and uh, here. So as uh, hands-on as a person who has hands-on experience of combating our repression, how does the language of uh, repression uh, affect the way you show uh, solidarity uh, with people who are uh, being repressed? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, that's a question I could spend hours answering, so I'll be I'll try and be brief. I'll start by saying that I'm speaking in my own name and I identify not just as an anti-repression activist but as an anti-penitentiary activist. Uh, this is a very important aspect, one which uh, involves the need to think about utopia and I wanted to bring some utopian thinking to the table here. Uh, this is an argument often made against uh, persons involved in anti-penitentiary movement. So what happens if uh, prisons are shut down uh, tomorrow? We'll have chaos, uh, anarchy, and uh, what do we do with all the convicts? That's not the point. Uh, without a critique of capitalism, abolitionism won't uh, help. Uh, so um, I'll be uh, thinking about how to reorganize uh, society so that it's not a capitalist uh, society based on exploitation as regards uh, repression solidarity i'd actually go back and ask uh, what is the law as uh, we see it as anarchists and, and also in utopian thinking so do you know the law what kind of acts of law we have we have the constitution we have ratified international agreements we have uh, statutes uh, ordinations regulations we have the criminal code the family code the civil code and there's a lot of that and obviously the code of misdemeanors uh, we don't know the law in its entirety uh, we didn't make the law we uh, were born in a system uh, where this law was imposed we can't uh, disagree we can't but if we don't know the law and if we're caught by the law enforcement agencies were punished were uh, penalized but very often uh, this law is used in an instrumental way to criminalize to intimidate to curb people's freedom and in this sense if there was uh, if tomorrow uh, there was no law i'd still know how to behave so from my perspective as people, we have the ability to create 
to define ways of cooperating. And uh, nobody has to tell us what these rules have to be. I mean, you have absurd laws every now and then, you have these uh, funny articles saying that in the UK, for instance, uh, you're not allowed to uh, make stickers with the Queen if the Queen's head is upside down. Or you're not allowed to die in the British Parliament because that's illegal. I mean, we can laugh, but uh, the truth is that we're living in a system where these uh, regulations uh, are in effect and we're subject to them. And many people, uh, for not abiding by these uh, rules, end up in a prison, a remand prison detention center police custody. So, as activists, even if we uh, don't accept that uh, law, if we protest against that law, but we can't go beyond uh, the law. And that's something I uh, see in terms of distinguishing between people who are victims of political repression and uh, not political repression. So, who is a person who is uh, uh, repressed uh, on political terms? Is th but what about someone who is not uh, subject to political oppression? And examples I can give you uh, in terms of uh, solidarity. So, I mean, obviously, we will go outside the precinct to, to protest if they arrest uh, uh, Babcia Kasia, who's uh, an activist and a senior citizen, we love her. But uh, will we show the same, did we show the same solidarity last year when the police shot Adam and Konin to death? No. And I was following groups on social media, even radical uh, left-wing groups uh, weren't sure whether they should show solidarity. Okay, the guy was running from the police, but maybe he had drugs on him. But uh, we, I mean, we have no doubt I mean, if the uh, police uh, maces a journalist, uh, we will show solidarity. But I don't remember huge uh, demonstrations, uh, protests, when a police officer uh, choked uh, Rafał from Legionowo for having uh, one gram of marijuana. Uh, clearly, we will show solidarity with people who organize a peaceful protest. But in July last year, when Margot was arrested for uh, allegedly vandalizing a van. There were protests, uh, even in the left-wing uh, bubble, uh, we're still being a uh, legalist, and this is uh, hampering our activities, uh, because we, when we have to choose uh, who we want to express uh, solidarity with. So let's uh, try and open our minds a little. And I mean, a lot of people in this uh, country are being repressed, oppressed every day due to their underprivileged uh, position because they were born in the wrong family, in the wrong borough, neighborhood, in the wrong town. And in uh, closing, sometimes I have the impression, even though I personally uh, show support and love, how do I put this? Um, so the whole, I, I'm all in favor of legalizing same-sex marriages. I'm all in favor of uh, same-sex couples having the right to adopt, of uh, legalizing migration. But I think my support um, should be up until the moment when these groups get that right, because they don't have that right at the moment. My objective, if I'm thinking of a society I want to live in, a utopian society. So that's a uh, society where legalization would not be needed. At, so at this point I show solidarity, but if we think only about legalization and no further, uh, we can't uh, think uh, in utopian terms, and that's it. Okay, great, thanks. Super, thank you. Uh, seeing as the uh, statements were a little longer than we expected, we have uh, half an hour left. And maybe we can modify the question that we prepared a little bit. And also, based on what you said, or actually you've answered the second question to a uh, certain extent, namely, who is excluded by in a world where legalization is normalized? Uh, so who is uh, 
who can hear it poor and who is excluded, who is stigmatized. And we see that decriminalization often serves uh, to have a certain group of people uh, to have another law applied to a different group of people, different group of people. So I wanted to ask about language. Because many conflicts today unfold in within language. And I'm referring to the new language. You've uh, said a lot about stigmatization. So let's imagine a language in your fields and what type of narratives would correspond to a language of solidarity and care, a language that could be applied to uh, usher in, create a better reality uh, in the context of the groups you, you're you um, involved with. So let's have Karolina uh, go first. Right. I feel that I've uh, spoken about uh, criminalization a lot and not enough about what criminalization means, but it does, it is connected. And a lot of what I wanted to say about the world we have um, because of uh, criminalization, but a lot's been said already, and it has to do with language because it is all very connected. So briefly, I wanted to say what criminalization means when applied to abortion. And it does translate into language, a language of stigma. I think that the world of uh, criminalization is the opposite of what we want as the abortion dream team and other pro-abortion uh, activists. Uh, so what we want is radical empathy and radical trust. And because of criminalization, we don't trust uh, one another. We don't trust uh, people who decide what to do with their pregnancy. And we don't trust one another, each other. Uh, people who live in a world where there is a constant threat. Agatha put it well, I think, because uh, decriminalization uh, creates a makes us feel unsafe. I can't trust anyone because if I tell someone, they'll denounce me. Uh, and um, the language of stigma also is related to that. So there's good abortions and bad abortions, saying that it's abortion on demand, or that we get up in the morning and uh, it's uh, we want, decide to have an abortion because we feel like it. But even if we do, so what? It's not your business. It's a question of expectations. You're uh, supposed to explain yourself why you're having an abortion. And it also translates into the language of expectation. But why? Are you sure you did everything to avoid being pregnant? Uh, I mean, you could have used protection, but why did you do it that this way? Why did you do that? Are you sure you don't... Uh, are you sure you don't want to carry it to term and uh, decide? Um, so that's a language of expectations, but it's also a language of shaming, of um, um, us, of um, the language of ridiculing us, uh, saying that, are you really so uh, stupid that you got pregnant? It's the 21st century, there's so much contraception, so much birth control around. Again, it's a language of uh, shaming, it's a language of control, you should be ashamed if it's your second abortion, if uh, you had an abortion already. So you should be ashamed of yourself. I mean, if you have sex, uh, you can get pregnant, You that's something you should reckon with. So we're being uh, ridiculed and uh, shamed uh, because we're accused of not being mature enough, not knowing enough. And we don't trust uh, these people, we don't... Uh, and so we do make mistakes in our reproductive decisions. So we do do things that we regret. I mean, we have second thoughts. Okay, we should have done it differently, but why don't I want to be in this uh, situation? It's not because abortion is bad. Abortion is the best thing that can happen to someone who's pregnant and doesn't want to be pregnant. That's the best thing that can happen. It's not a question of abortion. Abortion is not the problem. 
the thing is, I don't want uh, to be in this situation. I mean, nobody wants an abortion just like that, but we don't want to be in a situation where we're uh, judged. Uh, we have to uh, explain ourselves why we're pregnant, why we don't want to be pregnant, why so late, how come we, why we didn't tell our partner. Uh, maybe we should do all these things uh, to deserve an abortion. And um, that's one. There was a recent situation in Kielce when um, somebody uh, said uh, how the doctor uh, spoke to them. On our website, there's a transcript and a recording of that. It's the language of power, the language of control, the language of a lack of trust. It's the abortion stigma, but also because we give ourselves, we give. It's uh, this. This goes for transgender people as well. And questions about what kind of genitals do you have? Will you do this or will you do that? It's intrusive. Expecting, I mean, it's like Helena said, you, you're, why didn't you come in a dress? It's a language of control, expectation. People giving themselves the right to ask intrusive questions uh, and uh, to encroach upon uh, areas where you're not invited, that are none, none, none of your business. But because it's so stigmatized, because it's uh, so, it's an area where uh, society and a lot of people, uh, people who have power over us, uh, give themselves the right to encroach, uh, to judge us. And like what Ola called a legalistic uh, attitude, it has to do with a fetish of criminal l law. I mean, I can support Margot, but not if she assaulted someone. If she hit someone and uh, vandalized a truck, then she damaged the property. Okay, I'm a lawyer myself, but uh, frankly, I'm a special kind of lawyer, but I really don't know all these uh, acts by heart. But frankly, so uh, I uh, give myself the right uh, to uh, demand that this person uh, work to get my solidarity, my support. Because if you don't uh, act the right way, if you go to bed with the wrong people or the wrong way, then you don't deserve it, you're stupid, and you don't deserve to have an abortion. Or if you did uh, go somewhere, then you're cool because you're fighting for um, non-binary rights and LGBT rights, so we're all happy under the rainbow. But again, you have to be behave and uh, deserve to... Uh, uh, for me to show solidarity with you. So it's all about uh, control, and the uh, law uh, normalizes this control, these expectations, this lack of empathy, this lack of trust. And uh, but what we want is radical empathy, radical trust, and radical empathy is not that I'm so big-hearted that I understand and I feel compassion for everyone, that's impossible. But uh, that's not uh, necessary for me to show solidarity and care. However, the law, and the, it's what this uh, forum is about, solidarity and care. So solidarity and care are made, are penalized. They say, okay, you're supporting someone, but that makes you a uh, criminal. Screw that. I will help. I will support people, even if you call me a criminal because what I'm doing is good. But somebody decided, and I totally agree with Ola, somebody decided that they'll call it aiding and abetting, and in violation of the law on abortion. And nobody will remember what uh, Andrzej Marek and Andrzej Tsol wanted in 1996 when they were writing the criminal code. What they wanted was um, not to develop, uh, not to encourage illegal backstreet abortions. I mean, that was the uh, reality. So either you had a, an abortion at a hospital or you went to see a private uh, practitioner who did it for uh, money. So it was. it's not a question about me putting on stickers, uh, uh, advertising abortion without uh, borders. And online, and uh, I'm looking at you, uh, penal dogmas, Will uh, a sticker saying abortion without borders uh, will support you? Is this aiding and abetting? So this is the language of uh, intimidation, shaming, 
and um, and you can't do anything because if you tell someone that they can uh, call a phone number and find out where you can get an abortion, or if you uh, drive someone to the border, is it a crime uh, before the po um, in Poland or before you cross the border, or if you give or pay for pills? So. Uh, uh, this expansion of the criminal code. The criminal code does mention aiding and abetting. It mentions helping uh, someone, a specific person who's uh, pregnant and who stops being pregnant as a result of our assistance. But uh, uh, sticking a sticker on a lamp post uh, saying you want an abortion, here's a phone number. So that is that, that has nothing to do with that regulation. But since uh, criminal law is fetishized, and saying, oh my god, it means everything, it applies to everything, then people are uh, scared, are simply scared, and their um, security, their safety is uh, threatened, and uh, solidarity and support uh, provided by uh, people, uh, and they really don't have to sit around uh, wondering what to do with a miscarried uh, fetus in the 18th week, uh, so again, that, that's something uh, you need to deal with, so these are cases where we are at risk, but uh, when somebody um, reports you to the police for stickers, so uh, somebody came uh, to the police station with a bunch of stickers and says a crime has been committed, and the police uh, um, decided to launch proceedings, uh, an inquiry. So this aiding and abetting in abortion has become such a fetish, uh, such an obsession. But why? This has to do with normalization and criminalization. Okay, we have a provision, a regulation, aiding and abetting is uh, prosecuted, and you have, don't have to be a fundamentalist activist, Kaya Godek, uh, to say that saying the word abortion, and maybe a pregnant person will hear that word, that's equal to encouraging. I mean, that that's, uh, actually that person is uh, totally um, obsessed with the issue, but even the so-called pro-choice movement, and we hear this uh, from a lot of people who are pro-choice, a fine, a fine pregnancy, you can terminate, uh, and uh, it can be... So this can be somebody who's theoretically an ally, but uh, it's also uh, intimidation, uh, if they speak that way, and I think that's what we're talking about, uh, control, authority and fetishizing of criminal law. And one last thing I wanted to say is that nobody has a problem with the fact that somebody who comes to a hospital during a miscarriage after having taken pills, that person uh, has to I mean, deal with the fact that the doctor might call the police and the police will come to the hospital. Uh, nobody knows why, because nobody's uh, hiding or destroying evidence. Even if the doctor believes that they have to report a miscarriage, uh, they uh, can't say what um, crime has been committed, but they hear abortion pills and they grab their phone and the police uh, shows up. Why? Because there's this fetish of criminal law, this expansion, uh, this intimidation, this and the normalizing um, practices which are in totally ridiculous and that's it. Super, thank you. Wow, thanks. Agata? Agata? Thank you. I have to thank Carolina for um, saying a lot of things that I can uh, relate to now and follow up on the language used to describe sex work in um, discourse, in the right and the left, uh, the dominant language, the language which uh, dominates in, uh, also in feminist uh, spaces, is dehumanizing, objectifying, and offensive uh, for uh, sex workers, starting with the P word, which uh, places uh, sex work in a context, in a criminal context uh, that's very broad, uh, then the visual images, depictions of sex workers in the media. A few uh, days ago, yesterday, I think, in Gazeta Wyborcza, there was an article which I found shocking, frankly, as uh, someone who uh, who's a researcher and an activist. So it was shocking for me that in the 21st century, a um, newspaper that considers itself to be progressive 
uh, publishes a photo of uh, sex workers that's uh, objectifying, accusing the business of uh, objectifying and very offensive uh, depictions of sex workers without even giving thought to the fact if the people whose uh, images were used uh, gave their consent, I'm uh, totally sure that uh, they didn't uh, give their consent and that these persons might be recognized. So it's, uh, I think it's very interesting, actually it's uh, horrible and uh, scary, but uh, it's also uh, emblematic of the way we speak about sex work in Poland, uh, that sex workers are often um, mobilized, uh, exploited, and they're used uh, to um, gain capital if people want to get attention or if um, they want to vilify uh, like left-wing politicians, for instance, which was recently done by a conservative newspaper. So that's one issue, a uh, question of uh, sex workers being uh, used to um, for political gains or political ends. And also another thing that's important uh, for us in terms of language is this uh, moving away from a language uh, that dehumanizes, objectifies, uh, stigmatizes and re-traumatizes a language that's in line with uh, the language of control. So the language of prostitution, the term prostitution, because this is a modern legal category. It's uh, that constructs a category of people who should be controlled by the vice squad, uh, by an entire medical infrastructure, uh, people who should be punished uh, just for uh, providing uh, sex uh, services or doing sex work. And by uh, using this uh, language, we perpetuate the image of sex workers as uh, people who need to be controlled, uh, punished, and so on. Uh, not to mention the fact that the entire discourse, also in feminist uh, uh, discourse, uh, makes uh, sex work a, a pathology. So to be a sex worker, you have to be severely traumatized, uh, have been abused as a child, uh, be a substance user, and so on, as if all people, I mean, a women in Poland, I suppose uh, very few women, most women in Poland are no stranger to, um, sex, to abuse. And I think uh, Marta will also agree that uh, recreational uh, substance use uh, or psychoactive uh, substance is not uh, something that uh, affects uh, one single uh, group. In fact, it's uh, transversal. Uh, it, um, something that you find in all educational groups and all social groups. So it uh, creates a um, subject of a sex worker, which is a very um, a problematic, uh, questionable subject that has little to do with the reality of uh, sex workers. And it's like abortion, so-called abortion trauma, which is an invented uh, category. Uh, I'm sure it's interesting and it also uh, sparks, uh, mobilizes a uh, discourse, a medical, but also the whole rescue industry. We have a problem with the rescue industry in uh, sex work and in abortion, uh, just to uh, validate, justify what's being done for people who've had abortions or who are sex workers. Uh, and these people don't need help. It victimizes them and it uh, strips them of their agency. And I think we have the same uh, mechanisms in sex work and in abortion. Uh, let's, we uh, call for, or we want to speak about in terms of work, because it's the experience of sex workers. Uh, sex work is a work of, it's a gainful employment. And you can uh, validate this experience of uh, work by changing the categories, by moving away, abandoning uh, categories that uh, don't see it as work, because uh, sex work, as I said, is, is work. It's sexual, uh, physical, intimate, and emotional. So it's a multi-dimensional uh, type of uh, work. And uh, moving to the discourse away from a discourse that stigmatizes, that places uh, sex work uh, somewhere within the remit of uh, criminal law, which is being fetishized, uh, moving it into uh, the sphere of work that uh, changes the challenges and needs faced by sex workers. They don't need to be managed, they need rights, they need fundamental workers' rights, they need to have agency, 
They need to have subjectivity, occupational health and safety, which they don't get if they're criminalized. Basic uh, uh, work safety, I know it's boring, but it's fundamental for, um, it's not very interesting, but it's um, important uh, for uh, sex workers and also removing so it would involve redefining uh, the discourse and uh, calling attention to other issues because we were look at the relations, the uh, life of such workers in terms of their needs as workers. And I totally agree with Ola in that uh, the law is an arbitrary construct and uh, we need to uh, consider whether we actually need the law because the law creates uh, generates a crime. A crime needs uh, the law and it's a self-perpetuating mechanism that perhaps we don't need as a society. I personally believe that uh, it, uh, economic redistribution would be more useful than criminalization and uh, defunding the police as well and to finance uh, local uh, communities and institutional institution building, this would create a better world. But um, when it comes to sex work, yes, because, I mean, we're not talking about deregulation, we talk about uh, workers' rights. So shifting discourse from criminality to work uh, is a response to the need for uh, securing and uh, ensuring the workers' rights of sex workers which are not uh, provided. Uh, and one more thing, I'm sorry, I lose a sense of time when uh, I start talking, so uh, cut me off. Yeah, it's uh, almost almost done. One last thing that I think is important in terms of scaring. Uh, Carolina uh, said a lot about the narrative of abetting, of complicity, which uh, um, it makes it impossible to provide solidarity because it uh, scares and intimidates uh, people um, with fines or uh, punishment for a uh, betting, um, and you become a monster for doing that. So as the only group in Poland which uh, supports uh, sex workers regularly, we're called the pimp lobby, and we're seen in terms of accomplices, in terms of aiding and abetting, so it's a, a discourse that threatens with uh, criminalization. Publishing this uh, book, this group, uh, this uh, collection, this handbook of uh, experience, uh, real-life experience uh, of sex workers, and it's a handbook on how to work safely, how to manage your time, how to avoid uh, burnout, uh, what the law is. So for, for publishing this, We've been accused of encouraging, of uh, luring people into sex work, practically. And uh, it's also seen as pandering, a procurement. So the discourse used to describe us, a self-organizing uh, group, is a discourse that uh, intimidates us and uh, that criminalizes us, potentially. So as with aiding and abetting, this is a mechanism that's uh, meant to restrict uh, and stop, prevent solidarity and support. Great, thank you very much. And now, Magdalena Bartnik, I'll try and be brief. For me, when talking about language and criminalization of possession or criminalization of narcotics, it's like uh, Agata said, it doesn't affect everybody equally, and some people it doesn't affect at all. So this uh, dehumanizing, exclusive and stigmatizing language is the language used by this system, the war on drugs, but the war doesn't affect everybody the same. And that's uh, crucial when thinking about what decriminalization should be, what kind of a chance it gives to stop the irreversible uh, damage that this uh, policy has uh, caused the irreparable damage. As this uh, language affects uh, people who are most uh, vulnerable, who are least uh, privileged, we talk about them differently than people who are in a better 
position, and it's not because uh, someone has a problem or not, but if someone is privileged, and if they have uh, more money, even if they have a dependency and addiction, they will manage. But uh, stigmatization, systemic uh, stigmatization, affects this uh, specific group of people who are dependent. And this uh, language has uh, two sources, it, um, which uh, shows that uh, decriminalization is not enough on its own, and decriminalization is not the answer to the problem. It doesn't give people uh, agency, it doesn't give people freedom, the right to self-determination. And uh, users, at some point, want to speak as users, and not as uh, convicts or uh, patients. The language of uh, criminal uh, law and the language of public health, the language of uh, treatment, is are both uh, stigmatizing, and that's the trap, because when talking about users, the group of um, users who are in the most difficult position, because you might not feel stigma if you're a drug user, but you feel a stigma, and it's also a question of survival. So the language, the medical model, used in the medical model, it also uh, perpetuates this message and images, uh, representations that the system has created. It's all saturated, it's all um, by this war. I speak of war because it is a war. It's a war on, it's a war against uh, users. It's a war against everybody, but not everybody's an easy target. Uh, so, users uh, speak about uh, stigma and discrimination. That always comes up in the first uh, uh, sentence, and it's hard to imagine that discrimination itself can change anything. I mean, obviously, these people are no longer treated as uh, people who uh, have um, charges for illegal possession, but they're uh, placed in a different context, and uh, that's not a solution. And let me refer back to what I said before about uh, legalization, that might not be feasible in the near future, I won't live to see it, but uh, maybe one day my children might not live to see it either. But again, uh, perhaps one day it's a, it's a far, uh, it's a long-term thing. This war is um, rooted, it's part of the capitalist system. It had a racist, it was racist in origin. And it fits in, it's part of this world. I don't know, can you imagine a world without a war on drugs? Or the US without a war on drugs? It's like an inherent, imminent part of the way we think and uh, the way we see it, uh, legalization, um, which would be based on speaking about freedom. Freedom regardless of uh, how dangerous uh, uh, the things you do are, your body as your body, as long as you're not harming anybody else, you have the right to decide about your body. Some things you do are safe, others aren't, uh, you do things that some people consider dangerous, but you don't. So it's uh, decision-making. And um, that's the strongest... And the position of all user movements is that we don't want to be as criminals, but we don't want to be patients either. It, you have to understand what dependence is and whether it exists in the first place, maybe it doesn't, so you have different models. But I'm talking about legalization as a uh, fantasy and um, something that you might have in the future. And only then will you rid yourself of the 
control, of uh, social control, of legal control, and say what. So it's a question of self determination. It's our choice, even if we made the wrong choices. Or something that, I mean, people say that uh, people who uh, are addicted don't have a choice, but it's not as simple as that. Uh, so it's a question of renouncing or giving back to uh, users and not uh, just uh, fighting for their rights or the right uh, to treatment, but letting them decide, giving them a say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Helena. You also uh, said a lot about patronizing nature of uh, medicalization. I'm sorry, my connection keeps uh, breaking up. I don't think I heard the question. I asked about language. I was going to ask about the language of solidarity and care, but instead it moved on to the way criminalization stigmatizes and excludes, and uh, while medicalization is patronizing. I'm sorry, I can hear myself. So moving away from a language of stigma towards a language that allows you to voice, express your um, interests, your ideas, your dreams. Let me start by saying that the language used to speak about um, transgender individuals can be uh, dehumanizing, especially as regards the trans women. I suppose it's due to the patriarchy, but um, people wonder how come a person decide, because some people think that it's a choice, that it's uh, done on a whim. How can anyone decide, they ask, to uh, give up their male privilege and uh, degraded and molded. And um, I think that explains the stigmatization of trans women. These people are considered uh, unhinged uh, sometimes because, like, how can you do that? Which explains uh, maybe why you need so many uh, psychologists' opinion to check uh, to, uh, if you're sound of mind. But basically it's also a means of control, an instrument of control. And then there are these slurs you find in the right-wing media, which uh, think it's funny uh, to uh, that a guy dresses up as a lady. And there's nothing funnier. So it's um, hilarious. <clears throat> and and that's why transgender people are afraid to come out of the closet. I personally uh, heard uh, people being mocked, uh, people cross-dressers uh, being mocked, because for some reasons uh, in our society it's considered uh, funny for some reason. So that language doesn't help and uh, it keeps people from coming out of the closet and coming out. And uh, 
It has to do with uh, something you mentioned before, namely that a lot of the language used to speak about transgender uh, people has to do with reproductive issues, because hormone therapy is seen as something that can uh, uh, damage or uh, take away your fertility and surgery. Uh, reassignment uh, surgery also affects uh, your fertility, makes you, and a lot of uh, doctors are afraid to diagnose uh, transgender people because they're afraid of uh, being prosecuted, of being uh, prosecuted or uh, taking away somebody's reproductive uh, um, capacity or whatever the uh, term is so you have I'm not a lawyer so there's only a handful of uh, doctors who aren't afraid to uh, work with transgender people these are mostly uh, sexologists uh, who have the privilege because as sexologists uh, for whom it's so it's easier for them to uh, work with transgender people because the law says that sexologists are the only uh, medical professional uh, who can decide about other people's fertility and uh, there are very few of them of sexologists uh, sexologists and uh, so they use their position uh, like i need uh, nude photos of you uh, for uh, research purposes, otherwise I won't issue an opinion. And a lot of people agree to that, because they have no choice, they want to transition as, as soon as possible. They want to get uh, hormones, so they will do anything to get them. And another matter it has to do with uh, fear, uh, inciting fear in uh, transgender uh, persons, uh, saying uh, hormones are bad for you, uh, saying that you'll be seen as freaks, as uh, sick people, um, and uh, saying that we'll uh, regret the decision, but a study done in the UK on how many people re-transition showed that it was less than 1% and uh, among those, those who re-transitioned were uh, forced to do so by their family. So saying that we need uh, such a developed uh, gatekeeping system, uh, saying we need a, a system of control to make sure somebody doesn't change their mind. So that's based uh, really on uh, uh, very few people who uh, regret having uh, transitioned. Um, and it's um, exploiting, it's uh, using fear to control us. Or being a transgender person is seen as a club, so if you want to join, you have to meet certain requirements. So one of these requirements is economic privilege, because, I mean, you have to pass, you have to look uh, a certain way to be a transgender uh, person, and it also helps to have hundreds of thousands of Zlotys to pay for the surgery, and this applies to trans women in particular, because if you didn't begin hormones uh, as a teenager, it's difficult to undo and you need uh, hundreds of thousands uh, for the surgery to um, undo uh, testosterone, the effects of testosterone, and or you need to be privileged, uh, you need to have been born in the right family uh, where your parents uh, allow you to uh, begin therapy at an early age, but not uh, many people in Poland especially can uh, hope to have parents who'd 
agree to um, hormones or at least blockers. And one last thing, a lack of trust towards uh, of uh, transgender people. It's if we give someone hormones or if we let someone have an operation, so we don't trust that person to know what's best for them. And they shouldn't be allowed to decide about their own bodies, whether to take hormones, or whether to have surgery. And so again, there's a system of gatekeeping that needs to be set up. And one last thing, the binary language, that's something that affects me personally. Uh, whenever you people talk about transition, there's this binary language that this is uh, feminine, this is masculine, and uh, non-binary people are not uh, noticed. And there's a lot of sexism that uh, comes out uh, where uh, certain traits are associated with a given gender. I'm out of time, uh, so I think I'll uh, end there. I thank you very much. And in closing, let me ask Ola, uh, maybe for an optimistic utopian. Yeah, I'll try to be very optimistic. I'll begin on a pessimistic note and then I'll uh, smoothly um, move on to something more optimistic, the options we have as regards language. Uh, first of all, I'd strike out the word crime, punishment, largely because, or, uh, and I'd replace those uh, words, or I'd emphasize the term damage and restoration. Uh, the firms that are not used in the system or are used marginally. Why? Now let's take a look at uh, the justice uh, system uh, based on punishment. So you have a crime, a felony, an offense that's defined. So you have so-called uh, crimes where uh, it's not persons, uh, but the criminal code or the code of misdemeanors are um, harmed, the state is harmed and it's the injured, and it's the job of the state uh, to punish people. So the responsibility to address the problem the, is uh, given, is delegated to an institution that's uh, to decide on what type of punishment will apply. The injured party has a uh, very little chance uh, to say how they feel, how they, what happened to them, and they have no chance to verbalize, uh, express what their needs are. So this uh, passivity uh, has to do, applies to the offender, as well as the passivity of the uh, injured party. They're both passive. And the same goes for the verdict. In this uh, justice uh, system, you either win or lose, and that's the language we use in court. I lost my case, I uh, won my case. You don't have win-win situations. And uh, in that light, uh, punishment is often seen as uh, vengeance. We uh, hear people who say, when uh, the judge says, well, I would have given that person uh, 25 in years instead of 15. Uh, so, um, we have uh, nothing that can remedy uh, the situation. It's uh, vengeance and incarceration. And uh, the offender is a uh, the uh, person who's uh, the defender, uh, who's uh, stigmatized and sentenced. Not just them, but their whole family. And this uh, stigma is something that everybody who uh, uh, has a family member or, or a loved one in prison, but also everyone uh, who've had the police knock at their door. How would you feel if the police uh, knocked at your door now? What will the neighbors say? Will they point fingers at me? So punishment in this system affects uh, not just uh, people who've uh, broken a social rule, but also uh, more uh, people, a greater group. Another thing that I'd uh, strike out is the myth of the language as the uh, safeguard uh, of uh, s uh, security. And here, 
I want to uh, give you some numbers about uh, pen uh, penitentiaries. So if we do away with prisons, what do we do with murderers and rapists? Uh, now for some numbers. We have 74,000 uh, people uh, in prison in Poland. Uh, those uh, who have been sentenced for a rape and murder account for 17%. So the, uh, who uh, make up the majority of uh, convicts? That's theft, uh, burglary, aggravated uh, robbery, So, uh, uh, which in Polish law are seen as, uh, are defined as crimes against uh, property. So, uh, is that security? Uh, our, uh, does the law uh, provide security for ourselves, our persons, and our health, or uh, security for our property? And you need to look for alternatives. Uh, one alternative is the concept of restorative justice, and something which is, which I'm uh, more in favor of, uh, transformative justice. Uh, rest what's the difference in restorative justice? It's a process uh, that we're involved in, that the person who was injured and the uh, perpetrator, uh, the person who committed the act, it leads up to uh, mutual understanding. Because if we have 30,000 people in uh, uh, convicts who uh, are in there for theft or burglary, do we ask ourselves why they did that? Or what can we do as a society? to uh, prevent these things happening in the future. No, it's easier to put someone in jail, to lock someone up for five to eight uh, years. And restorative justice uh, gives us a chance to be involved, to take responsibility, to take ownership of the process. Let uh, people who have been injured uh, say what they felt, uh, what happened, and let them decide what could help them uh, get back to the previous uh, situation or might even improve their position. Somebody who violated a social m norm, standard, uh, can understand what happened, can understand what they've done to another person, and they have the opportunity to be a part of society again and not be stigmatized. If uh, somebody uh, um, leaves prison, uh, there's a 25% they'll reoffend. Uh, and um, but in uh, countries which have uh, restorative justice uh, programs, reoffending rates were much lower. And that's uh, nothing new. Uh, restorative programs have been around for many years now, not just in Europe, but for some reason they're not uh, being um, supported because, at least uh, so I believe, because they uh, require that we be involved, they demand the requires social change and uh, taking responsibility, ownership of what's uh, going on in society and responding to social. But there are examples of the Rojava community, the Zapatistas. Uh, Austria has restorative uh, programs. France has uh, restorative uh, programs. The states uh, which lead the world in mass incarceration, the US also has uh, restorative justice and all the evidence shows that these programs are effective, possible, and can be um, implemented in our society. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much. I think it's time to end because we've gone over uh, the time limit. It was very interesting. And at this stage, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, brands and threads that we could uh, discuss for hours. But I think we've managed at least to uh, mention uh, or address uh, topics uh, that don't come up very often. And I hope that it will be continued, uh, at least uh, in terms of uh, coming up with an alternative uh, vocabulary language and uh, a solidarity that's not demarcated by the law. Uh, that doesn't lead up to a situation where we serve the law and not one another and not help one another. And that's what made it interesting. That's why it was so interesting to hear all these perspectives. Uh, but there were a lot of common uh, strands. Um, and I hope uh, this will be uh, continued. I hope there will be a follow up. Uh, thanks a lot for being here with us, for sharing your thoughts. And I think. And really, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you.